inaugural conference. Please take your seats. Conference will begin shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chair of Conference, Paddy Lillis, and the Platform Party. Good morning and welcome to the 2016 Labour Party Conference. Conference this year, we have more delegates than for many years. So if this is your first conference, or if you've been many times before, I hope you have an enjoyable and an inspiring week. Conference, it is great to be back in Liverpool this year. And to welcome us, I would like to introduce one of our team of city councillors, the Lord Mayor of Liverpool, Ross Gladden. Ross. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Conference. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to Liverpool and to this Labour Party Conference. As you probably know, Liverpool is a fantastic leading city in the UK and has made massive strides towards a better future over the last 10 years. Since 2010, we have a Labour Council and an elected Mayor, Joe Anderson, who has a great vision for our city. And despite massive government cuts, we are making real progress in economic achievement, and the signs of regeneration are all around you, literally. Liverpool is a vibrant city, full of character, individuality, and confidence. Its people have a unique sense of humour, resilient, brave, and proud, and cannot bear injustice. This can be evidenced by the fantastic 27-year fight by the Hillsborough families who were determined to gain truth and justice for the 96, and in April this year got the inquest verdict that they deserved. <laughs> Last week, it was my honour, along with Mayor Anderson, to confer the freedom of the city posthumously on those 96 loved ones who went to a football match but never came home and never was that um, more deserved than those group of people. <laughs> our people are our greatest ambassadors and a font of knowledge. And if you ask someone for directions, they won't just tell you how to get there, they'll probably go with you. And next thing you know, you'll be swapping life histories. We have a burgeoning cultural scene. We're known for our museums, our art galleries, our nightlife and our events and we are officially one of the safest cities in the UK. Our knowledge quarter, centred around our universities, continues to flourish and grow. Our visitor economy is one of our major priorities, and since European Capital of Culture in 2008, Liverpool's tourism growth has consistently outperformed other areas of the UK and even a number of international destinations. For centuries, Liverpool has offered a welcome for those needing refuge and our diversity is our strength and is what has created a strong and vibrant culture. If this is your first or your 40th visit, I'm sure this won't be your last. But a few words of warning. In 1985, I went to a Labour Party conference in Bournemouth and I met my future husband. <laughs> yeah. I was from Derby and he was from Liverpool and eventually I followed him home. I've never left, and every day I love this city just a little bit more, and Liverpool has a way of worming itself into your heart, and before you know it, you're hooked. Four Beatles, three universities, two football teams, one city, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Ross.
Colleagues, brothers and sisters, a warm welcome to Liverpool. And can I open my remarks by congratulating Jeremy on his re-election as leader of the Labour Party. <clears throat> Jeremy's, Jeremy's re-election reflects the desire among party members for a radical alternative to the Tories' austerity agenda. And we've also seen thousands of new members join the party. And we need to welcome and engage with these new members. Conference, we have seen a lot of change in the last year. But one thing remains the same, and that is we need a Labour government at the next general election. Labour ex exists to fight for social injustice, to campaign for inequality, to ensure everyone in society is guaranteed a standard of living, Conference, we have a duty and a responsibility to the people, the communities we represent, to get ourselves into a position where we can win the next general election. Conference, we have bold principles, we have ambitious policies, and we must win. Because without winning, the principles and the policies mean nothing. Conference, chairing the NEC over the last year has been an honour and a privilege. And as you might imagine, it's been an experience. Over the last 12 months, I have endeavoured to chair the NEC with an even hand. And conference, whatever the differences over policies and procedures, we must remember that what unites us is more than what divides us. <clears throat> and as important, we must never forget we are all on the same side. In congratulating Jeremy on his re-election as leader, I want to also pay tribute to Jeremy as he's always behaved and acted in a camaraderie fashion at the NEC meetings. Jeremy has shown us that whatever our differences, Labour people must treat other Labour people with respect. We need to admit... <laughs> we need to admit that in the party over the last year, we have not always shown enough respect to each other. At times, our debates have dropped below the standards acceptable for the Labour movement. And there has been too much abuse and not enough listening, and too much name calling and not enough genuine discussion about policies. Conference, abuse is too easily found in political debate in today's society. The advent of Twitter, social media, and online debate should have been a great democratic step forward. Instead, it seems to be a green light to some of the worst abuse of political representatives and opponents. The most extreme example of this abuse of public representatives was the tragic murder of Joe Cox, MP. And colleagues will be paying tribute to Joe later today, but I wanted to make one small comment at this point. Joe Cox was murdered in the course of doing her job as an elected representative serving the public. We in the Labour movement should more than anyone else make it clear that the abuse, harassment and attacks on political representatives because of their views is totally unacceptable. <laughs> Conference, the Labour Party is a broad church. We have a party leader, we have party members, we have affiliate organisations and we have our MPs. And we will only be successful as a party if we acknowledge each other's contribution to the movement. In recent days, there has been some speculation in the media about deselection of Labour MPs. Conference, our MPs are making a great contribution. They are the people that the constituents turn to when the Tory policies bite. They are the public face of Labour in the constituencies. And the MPs are doing a great job in promoting Labour and working for their constituents. Conference. Conference, our only hope is if the party comes together in a spirit of real unity. The party leader, the party membership, the affiliate organisations, the MPs, all have a part to play. And each part needs to value the contribution and the mandate of every other section of the party. So if we're going to move forward as a party, we don't want to deselect MPs we already have. We need to be working to add to their numbers by getting more Labour MPs elected. The deselection we want to see is the Tory MPs lose their seats at the next general election. 
conference, as chair of the National Executive, I want to also pay tribute to the work of all members of the NEC over the last 12 months. The National Executive is there to take difficult decisions in the best interests of the party. And you might agree or disagree with individual decisions, but I know, and I hope you recognise, that all members of the NEC carry out their duties with honesty and integrity and take decisions with the best interests of the party at heart. And Congress, I also want to give credit to Ian McNichol, our great General Secretary of the Labour Party. He, he has made a huge contribution in helping the party navigate its way through an extremely tough year. And we should also acknowledge the work of all the staff employed by the Labour Party. As you might imagine, this has not been the easiest year for our party staff. But as always, they just get on and do the job. And it is only right to acknowledge their work, commitment and dedication to this great party. Conference, we have a busy week ahead. We need to turn our attention to the policy agenda. Politics in Britain is still very much overshadowed by the referendum vote for Brexit. Britain leaving the European Union could have serious consequences for the economy, for jobs and for workers' rights. And we as a party also need to look at what happened in many traditional working class communities where people, our people, voted for Brexit because they feel ignored, left behind and overlooked by the political process. And in the aftermath of the Brexit vote, we have seen a rise in hate crime on the streets of Britain. Migrant workers and British ethnic minority communities are facing abuse and hostility. This is unacceptable and must be tackled. We need to discuss these and many other issues, issues like the living wage, and how we as a party can become the champions of a living wage that means what it says. We need a real living wage that delivers a decent standard of living for workers and their families. Conference, these are just a few of the key policy issues that we need to discuss this week. And let us debate, discuss and take decisions in a spirit of unity and comradeship. Let us use this week to organise ourselves as an effective opposition to the Tories and to prepare ourselves to go out to campaign to win the next general election. Thank you, and I hope you all have a great conference. A conference. Each day we will receive a report from the Conference Arrangements Committee on the timetable of debates and speeches and any other procedural issues. To present the first report, please welcome the Chair of the Committee, Harry Donaldson. Good morning, Conference, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to Liverpool for this year's annual meeting of our party. May I also begin by congratulating Jeremy Corbyn on his victory yesterday on behalf of the CAC. Conference, our party continues to grow, and as Pazzi has said, I'm pleased to announce that this growth in numbers of members is reflected in applications to this conference. This year's conference sees over 4,500 members registered to attend, the highest for many years. We welcome all members and visitors to conference, and I hope that you all enjoy the conference. Conference has a very busy fringe this year, with over 400 fringe events taking place throughout the conference. The fringe programme offers a huge range of debates and receptions, and I'm sure everyone will find events of interest for them. This year, our exhibition has over 150 stands and represents the third sector, leading businesses, unions and NGOs. Our Liverpool exhibition will also feature our business lounge and the ALC zone. New this year, we have complimentary phone charging pods, which I am sure will be used and well received. To help delegates and visitors get the most out of their time at conference, the conference app is available for iPhone, Windows and Android, giving information about the venues, exhibition stands and fringe events, as well as the conference agenda. 
Fringe information is also contained in the conference guide. There have been a number of amendments to the programme since the production of the delegates' report, and these are detailed in CAC Report 1. CAC Report 1 has been made available to all delegates and sets out the detailed agenda for today, as well as the broad timetable for the rest of the week. The CAC produces a daily written report with a detailed agenda, and these will be handed to delegates as they enter the conference hall, in addition to being sent out by email each morning. CAC reports are available to download from MembersNet, as well as being available in hard copy from the CAC office and the party stand. You will see from the agenda for the week that the CAC has sought to maximise the time available for debate, both on the conference floor and through the policy seminars that take place on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Ballots taking place this week are detailed in the delegates' report and will be repeated in the CAC report for the relevant day. Delegates should note the decision of the NEC not to hold the NPF priorities for the year ballot. All other, ball all other ballots will take place as detailed in the delegates' reports. Today's ballot is the priorities ballot to determine which contemporary motion will be timetabled for debate during conference. The ballot opened at 10.30 a.m. this morning and closes at 3 p.m. The four subject areas achieving the greatest percentage votes in the affiliate section and the four achieving the greatest percentage of votes in the CLP section will be timetabled for debate by the CAC. Results will be announced in the conference hall at approximately 5.25 this afternoon. This year we have 12 subject groupings in the ballot. Motions relating to organisational matters have been referred to the NEC. Those CLPs and affiliates whose motions have been ruled out have been provided with an opportunity to appeal and we thank those CLPs who made representation either in person, by phone or in writing. Compensating meetings take place in the ACC. They will be arranged with a staggered time with the first meeting beginning at 6.30pm this evening. Full details of these meetings will be announced by the Chair of Conference immediately after the announcement of the Priorities Ballot results. Delegates with motions in the Priorities Ballot should ensure that they make themselves aware of compensating arrangements should their motions succeed in the Priorities Ballot. On Monday, the ballot takes place to elect the National Auditors. This ballot is open to all delegates and will take place between 9am and 4pm on Monday. On Tuesday, the ballot takes place to elect the CLP section of the National Constitutional Committee. This ballot opens, is open to CLP delegates only and will again take place between the hours of 9am and 4pm. On Tuesday, there will be a card vote on proposed rule changes. CLP rule changes will be printed in an addendum to delegates' reports, which was emailed to delegates on Friday for information. In addition, the NEC has also agreed to bring forward the rule change from Ashfield CLP on trade union retired members' branches to this year's conference. In addition to these, the NEC agreed a package of rule changes at its meeting yesterday, which will be voted on as a single item. These are also available today as an appendix to this report, which was emailed to delegates this morning. All rule changes will be reprinted in the CAC report on Tuesday morning for ease of reference. Before I finally move the report, I wish to remind the attendees at conference that anyone wishing to enter the conference centre will need to be wearing a pass, and similarly, anyone wishing to enter the Pullman Hotel, which is the headquarters hotel, must be an accredited pass holder. Everyone should allow sufficient time to enter the conference centre. All delegates and visitors are asked for their cooperation and your patience is greatly appreciated. As ever, we want everyone to have a safe and enjoyable conference and the police, security staff and Labour Party stewards will be working together to achieve that. In concluding, I should draw to your attention that at 5 15 sorry, 45 in the agenda it refers to Diana Holland NEC uh, reporting. There's a slight typo there as Diana is down as an auditor. Diana is actually National Treasurer. With these remarks, Chair, I move the report to conference. Thank you, Harry.
conference. There's now an opportunity for anyone who wishes to uh, raise any points or questions about the CIC report. Before you make your point, please tell us your name and organisation from which you're a delegate, and then make your point briefly. Please don't be making speeches. If you do, I'll stop you. Uh, does anyone wish to raise any points? Okay. Point there. This colleague, uh, self second, and colleague at the back. Yes? You've just come up. Felicity Irwin, Oxford West and Abingdon CLP, and first time delegate to conference. <laughs> conference. Our contemporary resolution on fighting austerity has been ruled out. This is despite economic figures released last month that show the economy shrinking and the cost of living increasing. Things are getting worse now, and the current situation is not adequately covered in the conference report. We need an urgent discussion about measures to address these contemporary figures in the wake of Brexit, and it is unbelievable that such an important policy about investing in the economy and opposing austerity is not deemed contemporary. We are calling for specific initiatives to invest in infrastructure, manufacturing, green industry and housing. I'm therefore moving reference back and asking that our motion for auster against austerity is put forward for debate. Thank you. I've come to um, reference back on something. I'm the um, uh, delegate for East Devon, Dillis Hadley, and um, I wish to move a reference back. Uh, my CLP's rule change or constitutional amendment is about giving constituency and trade union branches the right to, to participate fully in the selection of parliamentary candidates. Now, this was ruled out. Um, and um, the Collins report, which was used as the reason, um, we, f we feel um, is, is not correct. It's, um, as its name implies, it's a conference report which cannot therefore be used to invoke the three-year rule, which refers to constituents, um, constitutional amendments. That's the first objection we have. And the other one is, additionally, the Collins report only makes reference to leadership elections. And the East Devon Amendment relates solely to the selection of parliamentary candidates. So we felt that it was a different issue entirely. Um, I therefore move reference back, and I would like to insist that this amendment gets heard this year. It was submitted in the correct time frame last year, and it is also entirely contemporary to Jeremy's speech yesterday, where he said, we need to go into every community. Um, and um, it fits in with the aims of the party, as he explained so eloquently yesterday. Yeah. I see. Is the next colleague kind of show of hands? Anyone else wants to come in? Colleague there, colleague there. Anyone else? That seems to be. Yep, come on up. Please. No, sorry. Good morning. Um, Wayne Blackburn from Pendle CLP and Deputy Secretary of Disability Labour. And it's just a very quick point of order. We've had a number of complaints to Disability Labour about the, the access to both the conference hall and the fringe events. And we'd like to request a, a quick meeting today with the CAC to discuss these issues and try and improve them going forward. Thank you.
Comrades, uh, Max Shanley, Young Labour, first time delegate. Uh, I wish to move reference back on an important issue. If you look at page eight of the Conference Arrangements Committee's report, you will see that they have said that the uh, NEC's agreed package of rule changes will be presented to us just as one vote. I don't think that's very right. Uh, there are a lot of rule changes coming forward to uh, paraphrase the uh, former General Secretary of the Union of Communication Workers, Tom Jackson. The NEC are putting rule changes like a conjurer pulling rabbits out of a hat. We need time to debate these issues. Uh, and so I move reference back. Uh, Conference, George McManus, Beverly and Holden, the CLP, and also National Policy Forum Rep for Yorkshire and Humber. Max put it very well, and he, this, uh, I hate to think how many conferences I've been to, but Max has already picked up on it at his first conference. We know that rule changes can be controversial, and it's essential, I believe, that conference has the opportunity to look at them as individuals, so as to decide on their merits, because there is nothing worse than presenting to conference a take it or leave it package. It might well be that conference is overwhelmingly in support of three or four, but wants to reject one. Just as that makes bad policy making, it makes bad rule changes. So we've really got to consider this, and I hope, given past experience and given recent experience, that we reference this back. Okay. I think that's everyone, colleagues. Can I now bring Harry Donaldson in to reply to the point that's been raised? All right. Good luck. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just in the context of the last two speakers in terms of the rule changes, as in previous conferences, colleagues, where a large number of rule changes are tabled by the NEC, it is usual practice to take this as a single card vote. Large numbers of rule changes taken individually would be unwieldy and impact on the time available for policy debate. The NEC agreed the package as of yesterday. With regards to our colleague raising the issue in terms of disabilities, then really sad to hear that there are some problems and some issues because a lot of work and a lot of effort has gone into ensuring that we tried to get it correct. Only too pleased to arrange a meeting with the CAC to discuss that later today or during the course of conference, because it is an important issue. So we can make arrangements and we will certainly be in contact to make the necessary arrangements in time for that session to take place. In terms of item two, I think that was Phyllis. In terms of East Devon, again, all seven CLPs were offered the opportunity to make representation. None actually did. This rule was debated and defeated at conference in 2015, as it ruled out under the three-year rule. Um, at the special conference in 2014, which is correct, the Collins report dealt with the issue in the section on Westminster parliamentary candidates, and as such, the CSE agreed the amendment be ruled out under the three-year rule. We're happy to meet with the delegate if they want to further discuss this, have a meet with the CAC sometime during the course of conference or this afternoon. Again, we're happy to then meet and have a discussion with regards to that, because clearly no delegates um, were rep made any representation. In terms of felicity from Oxford West, I think the issue is that no one ever suggests that motions aren't important. Thank you for coming to the CAC. We had a delegate came to the CAC on Wednesday and made the points. We considered carefully the points raised, but concluded that the motion is not contemporary and therefore it was not included in the priorities ballot. Uh, again, you know, the issue was there that if any further discussion needs to take place or clarification, what was said at the appeal process, then happy to meet and happy to discuss. Thank you. Chief. Okay, thank you, Harry. Conference, just, just as a, I mean, a further point, uh, we take a single vote to accept or reject the CAC report. 
If delegates support a reference back, then they should vote against the report. That's been standard practice in each conference. So we must now vote on the CAC report, having listened to Harry's response on the points raised. And I see, can I see all those, fav all those in favour of accepting the report, please? Okay. Thank you. And those against? That's overwhelmingly carried. Conference, uh, we now come to the moment when we remember those colleagues who have died during the last year. And we have lost a number of valued colleagues, and the names of some of them are listed on page 11 of the NEC annual report and in the Conference Arrangements Committee report. There may be others who are known to you. We will be having a special tribute to Joe Cox this afternoon. Conference, we will celebrate the lives of our colleagues with applause. So please stand now to remember all those who have lost uh, since we last met. Thank you, Conference. Conference now gives me great pleasure to introduce two members whose outstanding contributions to the party we are recognising today through the presentation of the Merit Award. Our first Merit Award today is presented to Patricia Palmer of Y Forest CLP. Patricia has given so many years of service to the party that no one knows how many, not even Patricia herself, <laughs> although her party membership spans well over 50 years. As well as serving as a branch officer and town councillor for many years, Patricia has always had a sense of adventure and went on many trips with her late husband, Frank, including one to the Arctic Circle in a Morris Minor. As, dedicated, as a dedicated party activist, Frank designed and created the local party leaflets, whilst Patricia worked up the wording Having produced the leaflets, Frank and Patricia would go on to deliver large numbers of them as one of their passions was walking together. And as well as her commitment to the party, Patricia played a key role in community projects, establishing the Citizen Advice Bureau branch in Bradley. Her colleagues speak of her as can-do attitude and her lifetime dedication to the party and the wider labour movement. Patricia, uh, can come forward please to accept your award.
Do you want to say a few words here? Say it again. Come on. Just say it again. Yeah, yeah but you're at, the, you're at the mic now. I did say I am honoured to receive this, and I'm flattered by all the things you say I've done. You don't think you're doing them when you do them. It just happens. Everything I did was with the full support and hard work of my husband, who unfortunately can't be here. He died suddenly a couple of months back. I'm very sorry that he didn't even know about this and he would have deserved it with me. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. Conference. Our next award is to Martin Errington of Dover and Deal CLP. Martin joined the party as soon as he left school and a few years later became the CLP secretary, a role which he held for 34 years until 2015. He is credited with introducing the CLP to the computer age, modernising the CLP's local campaign strategies as a election agent, a role he has carried out many times over the years, using all of his annual leave to run the local campaign. And despite no longer holding office in the CLP, members are still known to regularly call on his wealth and knowledge and wisdom, particularly when it comes to the Labour Party IT systems. His colleagues describe him as an absolute selfless and say he has an immense patience, kindness, incredible knowledge, care, compassion and humility. His dedication and commitment galvanises and motivates so many local activists and we are pleased to recognise his many years of service here today. Martin, please come forward to accept your award. <laughs> Got that wrong. Yeah, th thank you, uh, comrades and, and conference. Um, this is, uh, without a doubt, a real honour, but I see it as something I do, do not really care for the limelight. I'm one of the backroom people, like many of you, and it's all about the people behind the scenes that are doing the work to ensure the party takes power, to put what we really, what we really believe in into practice. And I do feel honoured to have been able to serve the party for so many years, and I know many of you will be perhaps new to the party, and I really hope and believe that in the years to come that you will still be here and that we'll all still be fighting to elect a Labour government, to elect Jeremy in the very near future, to ensure... To, to ensure that we put our policies, our principles, our democratic socialist ideals into practice because that's why I joined the party, why I remember, uh, remain a member of the party and why I will, like all you, continue to fight for the party until we're back in power to do what we really uh, came into this organisation to do. So thank you very much.
Alors. I was, I was worried there. I thought they were having a brunch meeting. <laughs> Thank you and congratulations to our, our award winners. Conference, we will uh, spend the rest of the session discussing party campaigning and policy making. Included in this are the best practice awards, where we will recognise some of the innovative work being done in our CLPs and labour groups. And later on, we will have a short debate about the work of the National Policy Forum, where we will take speakers from the floor and we'll also hear about the party's digital campaign. And firstly, I will ask the General Secretary to address conference. Ian. Thank you, conference. Firstly, let me congratulate Jeremy on his victory in the leadership contest and commiserate Owen Smith. Jeremy, it was an impressive and a decisive win. As ever, it's a great pleasure to give my annual report to conference as your General Secretary. Isn't it great to be here in Liverpool? a wonderful, modern, European city, proud of its past and looking confidently to the future. A Labour city with a progressive Labour Council led by Jo Anderson and a fantastic candidate in next year's Metro Mayor elections, Steve Rotherham. Steve, I know you'll be a brilliant Labour candidate and a fantastic Labour Mayor. And of course, good luck to Andy Burnham in Greater Manchester and Sean Simon in the West Midlands. <laughs> Labour candidates, Labour values. We wish you all the best in the campaigns ahead. Millions of people have voted in elections across the UK since we last met. In Scotland, the result was devastating for Labour, losing seats not only to the SNP, but also to the Tories and coming third. We have so much to do to regain the trust of the people of Scotland, but Kezia has started that fight back. In Wales, our share of the vote dropped, but we held on. And I'm delighted that Carwin Jones remains as First Minister. <clears throat> In council elections, Labour suffered a net loss of councillors. But we won more seats than the Tories, and we won the elections in terms of share of the vote. And let's celebrate a great mayoral success. Labour's candidate, Marvin Rees, winning in Bristol. conference, there have been four parliamentary by-elections since we last met in seats previously held by Labour MPs. And I'm pleased to say we won in each of those four seats. We welcome Jill Furness in Sheffield Brightside, Jim McMahon in Oldham West and Royton, Chris Elmore in Oldmore. And that brings me to the fourth by-election this year. Conference, we should be delighted to welcome Rosanna Allen Khan, the new MP for Tooting. <laughs> right up until her election, Rosanna was a doctor in A&E at St George's Hospital where my kids were born. And why was there a by-election in Tooting? Well, we all know the reason. Because the MP for Tooting, whose dad apparently <laughs> was a bus driver, went and got himself 
a new job. It's a big role with huge responsibilities and he's making a great job of it. Conference, let's celebrate the success of Sadiq Khan as Labour <laughs> Mayor of London. You know, there were moments when I almost felt sorry for Zach Goldsmith. Almost, <laughs> but not quite. All that money, all that privilege, yet Zach couldn't buy his way into City Hall. A Tory campaign tinged with xenophobia and racism and hate. The Tory campaign was a disgrace and it deserved to lose. You know, I'm so proud of London, modern, diverse, multicultural, a city that said no to hate and division. Four by-elections, four Labour wins, four new members of the PLP. And there's one member of the PLP on our minds more than most this week, and that's Joe Cox. Joe was doing the job she loved serving the people she loved, in the place she loved. Jo was murdered because of what she represented. She spoke of unity, of hope, of a vision of a better world, and she was taken from us by bigotry and ignorance and hate. The outpouring of grief since her death shaped by the quiet dignity of Brendan, her husband and her family, reminds us that love will always triumph over hate. Today, <laughs> today following discussions and conversations with Jeremy, I'm pleased to announce the Joe Cox Women in Leadership Programme, a brand new mentoring scheme delivered in partnership with the fantastic Labour Women's Network. Over the next five years, we will train over 600 future women leaders, our biggest ever mentoring and development programme. Jo was a true champion of women in leadership roles and international feminism. And this programme will create a generation of women who can continue Joe's fight in local government, in parliament, and crucially in their communities, a fitting tribute to Joe's life and work. On Friday, the members of Batley and Spen selected our Labour candidate for the by-election on the 20th of October. Tracy Braben. Tracy, good luck for the election. <laughs> and let's reflect a moment on what it means to have a Labour MP. It means hard-working champions in their community. It means labour values of compassion, tolerance and justice. It means relentless surgeries and casework. It means endless work on the doorstep, on the streets and in the town squares. It means men and women drawn from the communities they serve, hard-working labour champions winning seats for labour and denying the Tories, the Liberals or UKIP that extra seat in Parliament. That's what the PLP is, Labour through and through and deserving of our wholehearted gratitude and support. <laughs> Let me now report on the finances of the party. For the past five years, I've focused on getting the party's finances back into shape. It's been tough. Those historic debts 
totalled almost £25 million in 2006. But after years of living with that burden, I'm delighted to report that at the end of last year, we paid off all of our debts, becoming debt free. <laughs> becoming debt free coincided with the surge in membership. The money the new members will add to our funds. The money the new members will add to our funds helps put the party in its strongest financial position for a generation. The Labour Party is debt free. <laughs> Just need to get into government and sort out the country now. <laughs> I want to say something about the people who work for the Labour Party. Paddy touched on it and thank you, Paddy. We expect a huge amount from them. I expect a huge amount from them. They work endless weekends and evenings. They drop everything to go and fight by-elections or work on local elections. They put this party conference together year after year. They are some of the brightest and the best our movement has. I value them, I respect them, and I stand in solidarity with them whenever they come under attack. And so... Because without them, our movement would be weaker. We all owe a massive debt of gratitude to the party staff. And I know that they want me to pass on their thanks to the NEC for their support over the last year and years, and to Paddy Lillis as our chair this year. Thank you, Paddy. <laughs> Let me turn now to the biggest event of the year, if not the decade the referendum on Britain's membership of the European Union. Labour ran a strong campaign under Alan Johnson. Alan and his campaigners made the arguments about job and trade and investment in every part of Britain. Alan deserves our gratitude for the campaign that he fought and led. There's a but, but it wasn't enough. UKIP and the right argument won, and that's a very bitter pill for us to swallow. So we as a party need to learn the lessons from the Brexit vote and listen to what people are telling us about their communities, their workplaces, their nations, and their sense of security. This must be a process shaped by Jeremy, by Labour, as much as by Theresa May. It must not be an excuse to throw away decades of accumulated rights and protections for British workers. Hard fought. <laughs> Hard fought and won by the trade unionists in this hall and by their previous generations. Never forget what Labour has done for British workers and always be proud of our achievements. Maternity, paternity rights, the national minimum wage, Sure Start centres, the right to join a union, the NHS. There will always be those Tories who want to write off Labour's years and pretend that no good come of them. Let's make sure none of us ever fall into that Tory trap. Labour was created for a very specific purpose, explicit from the very start. And that purpose is stated in black and white in our constitution, to organise and maintain in Parliament and in the country a political Labour Party, and 
the party shall bring together members and supporters who share our values. That's our party, a party founded to win elections and form governments, to make our values real through practical change. It's a powerful idea, and I haven't heard a better one. And exercising power and making choices, just like our Labour councillors, our police commissioners, our mayors do, day in, day out, week in, week out. And as Jeremy has said, no purpose is superior to the cause of winning elections and delivering real change for people. <laughs> let me just finish on this. Finally, conference, let us look to the future. We have come through the leadership election. Alongside our Deputy Leader, Tom Watson, I know Jeremy and the Shadow Cabinet will now take the fight to the Tories in the coming months and years. We are on a general electing footing and we must be ready. This is a party with now over half a million members united in our desire to defeat the Tories. This is a terrible Tory government split over Europe, tacking to the right on every issue, in dispute with the junior doctors and out of step with modern Britain. They're even talking about bringing back grammar schools, a uniquely divisive and demonstrably unsuccessful policy. And they think they can talk like this because Labour is too busy talking to itself. Well, no more. So we will step up our opposition in Parliament. We will campaign on the doorsteps with our many new members at the forefront of the door knocking, leaflet dropping and campaigning across the communities. And we will reconnect with voters we've lost in recent years and reach out to the new ones. That's the job of Jeremy. It's the job of Tom. It's the job of the PLP and our councillors. It's the job of the unions. It's the job of everyone with a party card. It's the job for all of us. Theresa May has never won a general election. And our task now as a strong, confident Labour Party is to make sure she never does. Thank you, Tom. Right, so we move on to the Best Practice Awards. I'm, each year, I'm, our affiliates, our constituencies, our elected representatives, socialist societies, I'm, all put in nominations for the awards. The work that you do in communities and capacity building. There are four winners this year, each who have impressed the National Executive Committee with their categories. For our Best Labour Party campaign category, I'm delighted to recognise the London Labour Party for the London Mayoral and Assembly campaigns. With the help of the incredible volunteers across London, not only did Sadiq win with a majority of 315,529 and a swing of 6.5% from the Conservatives, Labour successfully retained control of City Hall with the most diverse gender balance field of candidates ever selected. London Labour. Tom, turn it round.
Thank you. Well done. For our Labour in Local Government Award, the NEC wants to celebrate Calderdale Labour Group. On Boxing Day, Storm Eva went through the Calder Valley, affecting over 2,000 homes and 1,200 businesses. Local councillors reacted straight away in supporting the emergency services, using social media to get the important messages out and help in setting up flood hubs in towns affected. They have also secured vital funds for the infrastructure repair and flood alleviation. Calderdale Labour Group, do you want to come up? Engaging members and supporters is a key part of any local Labour Party success. I'm delighted to give, on behalf of the NEC, the award for this category to Ogmore CLP, who have gone that extra mile to welcome in the many new members to their party. Ogmore CLP. <laughs> There's always one. Brilliant. And our final category is the Dell Singh Memorial Best Practice Award for Socialist Societies, Affiliates and Member-Led Organisation. Please put your hands together for this year's winner, the Labour Women's Network. Following this year, following this, so come on up. this we will hear from the chair of LWN Olivia Bailey who will highlight some of their successes and excellent work they have done this year. Okay excellent Olivia. Uh, thank you very much, Ian, and can I just say how much we are looking forward to working with you and your excellent team to deliver our new training programme in Memorial for Joe. Um, it's an honour to receive this award today on behalf of every member of the Labour Women's Network. I'm really, really proud of the work that we've done this year. From our training programme, run by the phenomenal Nan Sloan, to our campaigning, where we have secured a raft of radical pledges from our leader, Jeremy Corbyn. All of our members have been bold, 
and relentless in their fight to secure their equality. But the sad truth is, conference, there should have been no need to give us this award today. Because an organisation to fight for women's equality in the Labour Party should not have to exist at all. We, we shouldn't have to fight for fair representation. We shouldn't have to fight for action to tackle abuse. We shouldn't have to build Labour women up because sexism in our movement has worn them down. Because conference, if we are the party of equality, then Labour women should expect equality, not have to fight for it. <laughs> conference, when Labour women work together, we know how much we can achieve. The first woman cabinet minister, the Equal Pay Act, abortion rights, all women shortlists, the Equality Act, we are the party of Ellen Wilkinson, Barbara Castle, Harriet Harman. But it is time to get organised again. Despite the fact that women make up nearly half of our membership, when you look at our CLPs, our councils and our leadership, women are few and far between. So whatever your politics and whoever you supported for leader, Join LWN's campaign to say to our party, no ifs, no buts, no equivocations. Make this party fair and safe for women because Labour women are brave and proud and fierce and it is time for them to lead. Thank you, conference. Thank you and congratulations to all the award winners. Conference, we will now have a short debate on the work of the National Policy Forum, whose report you should have. We will have debates on all the different Policy Commission reports, but today we are considering the report as a whole. Shortly we will take some floor speakers, so please be ready to indicate if you would like to speak. I will now ask Keith Birch to introduce the MPF report. Keith. Uh, conference, Keith Birch, NEC and Unison, moving the National Policy Forum report. Um, by rights, this speech uh, should have been one for someone else, for a dear friend, Mary Turner, who is the co-convener of the Joint Policy Committee. Her work has been really important to the M NPF, but Mary has been very ill for the last few months, but she is on the road to recovery. Um, she did manage, actually, to join us at the NEC meeting by phone for a couple of minutes last night. But while she's not here in person, she's with us in spirit, willing us on to build the policies that will return a Labour government and improve the lives of working people. Mary, I send you our best wishes as a true great of the Labour movement, and from your GMB colleagues and everyone here. I also want to take the opportunity to say a big thank you to everyone who has played their part in Labour's policy making in the last year. Thousands of members have played their part, debating policy and sending in their ideas, helping us to shape the NPF report before us today. Everyone who has played a part deserves our thanks, but I also again want to single out someone who has played an important role. Over the last few years, the NPF has greatly improved. I can say that the last cycle of policy making, which led to our manifesto, was the strongest yet. That is in large part due to the work of the National Policy Forum Chair during those years, Angela Eagle. Angela is principled, strong, and most of all, labor through and through. Angela, thank you. Yesterday we heard from Jeremy and he sent an important message that united we can build a better country. It's on this principle that the National F Policy Forum is built. It's our mechanism for coming together as a party to develop the policies around which we can unite and improve the lives of all of our communities. With Angela, we've begun the work of reviewing the process. 
what works in the NPF and what doesn't. That review, commissioned by Jeremy, continues, and we look forward to it bearing fruit in the months ahead. And I want to apologise to all those NPF members about the cancellation in June of the National Policy Forum meeting, but I com can commit the party that we will be having a full NPF later this year. So get your diaries ready, because we will shortly send out the dates for that once we've found a venue. Alongside that, the important work of considering policies has begun. Following the decision of conference last year, seven new policy commissions were established, consulting the party on priority issues. A strong economy, housing, early years, local transport, mental health, defence and policing. Over the last year, the commissions have consulted on and discussed these matters, together with the thousands of members who took the time to send in their ideas. We have formulated the Policy Forum report before conference this week. Our country is facing unprecedented challenges, uh, from Brexit to housing, from the need for a new industrial stra strategy to the pressures on our NHS. These are the challenges we need to meet. We need to show that only Labour can deliver. Building a strong economy, creating the good homes and good jobs we need, defending our NHS, our education services and schools, and all our public services, fighting for fairness, equality and social justice. Together, we need to build a policy platform that has the answer to the problems people face in their daily lives. It's the message of this conference, working together to deliver a Labour government. I move. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, colleagues, uh, Link 90 asked for speakers on the National Policy Forum report. We will take them in batches of three, and if you're called, you'll need to come to the desk in the front row so we know who you are. Um, can I also remind you of up to three minutes and no more. Can I see all those who wish to speak? Okay. At the back, yes. Who else? Pink, yep. And the lady here. First speaker, please. Thank you, conference. It's a really, it's a real honour to address you. I'm a first-time delegate. I just wanted to talk about mental health. Um, this issue affects up to 20% of people in society at any one time. The party, um, Jeremy Corbyn, appointed a shadow minister for mental health um, earlier last year, and this was a welcome step in recognising how important this um, issue is for society. 50%, thank you. 50% of people um, experience um, mental health at um, any one time. And it is important that this, uh, the party recognises that we need to improve mental health for everyone and um, explore uh, ways of better funding the NHS um, to ensure that these provisions are met. Thank you, conference. Um, Sarah Church from Wantage CLP, also a first-time delegate. I wanted to welcome the points made in the NPF report with reference to defence and international security. Um, I left the armed forces a year ago. I helped to implement the redundancy programme that has taken our numbers so low. I'm sorry to say that, but that was under the coalition government. 
When I was serving, I enjoyed the collective of uh, living in subsidised housing that was run. Um, it was publicly funded, and now everything's being privatised. And as is noted in the MPF report, morale is going down. Labour is the party to support the armed forces, not only for those who are serving, but for those who work in defence industries. I fear that public perception doesn't realise that, so I would ask that we can change that. We, we should be working for promoting peace and security, which is what it says in the report. But at the same time, we must support our conventional forces, to support those who work in the defence industry, and make sure that to know to have a peaceful and prosperous country, that we support our defence, and that Labour is the party that will support the workers and the soldiers, and that it's not the Conservatives who will do that. Thank you. Colleagues, while the next speaker's comment, can, I can take two more. Is there two more colleagues wants to speak? The lady here and the gentleman there at the back. After the morning conference, uh, Mick Johnston, Thurston Moulton constituency, uh, Old Labour, first conference. <laughs> we, we welcome much that is in the report, but we are distressed that it makes no mention of fracking. And that is, at this point, is a really serious omission, because the first planning permission for a commercial fracking operation uh, was granted earlier this year and in our patch. And I will see the rig when it goes up, even though it's several miles away from where I live. It uh, will have a big impact locally, but fracking is, is bad, bad, bad. Make no mistake. It is It is bad for the local environment, bad for the local economy, and it's bad, very bad, for global warming. There are over 700 independent peer-reviewed reports now. The, the, the evidence is stacking up, and it's all against fracking. Now, I think you may be excused for believing that it's just a local issue, but I've got news for you. There are eight, as of now, there are 800 blocks of, uh, with, with fracking license across the country. Those blocks are big. They make up in total 80,000 square kilometers of the land surface of the UK. That's a third of the land surface. And another way of looking at the extent of it is that over 250 constituencies have now got fracking licensed in their areas. And the only thing that's stopping fracking going ahead is planning permission. The, the developers have paid their money for the license. They're ready to go. And with uh, planning approval at Kirby Misperton, um, they will be going very soon. Just look at it this way. 250 constituencies, about 15 million voters will be affected by fracking in the next few years. We cannot, the Labour Party cannot turn its back on this issue. It's an issue that's going to force itself on constituency after constituency across the country. People are crying out, there are campaigns, hundreds of campaigns at local level, and people are crying out for political convincing uh, support from the Labour Party. In a Tory area, area like ours, they, they are looking particularly to the Labour Party to give a political lead. What we are asking here is, uh, not moving reference back or anything like that, but we believe we need an urgent review of the party's policy on fracking. And we, not, and we need CLPs that are at the front line to be involved in that review. Thank you. Hello, this is a great pleasure. I'm Margaret O'Nions from Carshalton and Wallington, formerly from Gloucester. 
I want to ask you to try and think about this. I have heard in some circles, we all hate the class system because it is destructive, it undermines people, it doesn't allow them to become themselves. Well, in some circles, there is PLU. Do you know what that means? People like us. We only go with people like us. Now, this is part of why we have such appalling policies from the present government. They simply are ignorant. And they choose to stay that way. Anyway, the main thing I want to say is please, please, let us think joined up with our policies, whatever they are. The economy is crucial. Man cannot live by bread alone, but he can't get far without it. And I can remember as a 19-year-old standing up in, front, in, in the middle of a cons young conservative party and saying that I thought no standard of living was reasonable while others were living below it. So let us make all our policies hang together. In, within the economy, we want jobs that pay enough for people to pay for the housing available. We want housing where the jobs are. It's a three-pronged three -pronged thing. It's the jobs, the housing, and the incomes. And let's put them all together instead of separating them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is the last speaker in this part. Um, hi, conference. Uh, I'm Sim Elliott. I'm a National Policy Forum representative for the South East CLPs um, on the International Policy Commission. Uh, and I read every single submission from Labour Party members it, to uh, the Britain's uh, Defence and Security Review um, priorities. Uh, I'd just like to make the point that I'm very disappointed that the National Policy Forum reports in the section on Britain's defence and security uh, priorities doesn't note that the vast majority of Labour Party members who made submissions to Your Britain indicated that they had um, a strong view that the Labour Party's policy on the Trident nuclear weapon system needs to be changed. Thank you for the contribution of all the speakers. I will now ask Tom Watson to address us on the party's digital transformation. Tom. Uh, good morning, conference. Last year we agreed that our party had to change. And I promise you I dedicate my deputy leadership to rebuilding our party from the grassroots up. I promised you a digital revolution. Now this year the NEC has agreed a new process of party reform. I'm pleased to be launching the first step in that digital revolution today. Many of these reforms will hopefully be agreed at the conference this week. Reforms that will mean all our members can take part, share their views and actively campaign for our success. Women in the Labour movement have driven important campaigns on issues like the minimum wage, fairer pensions, affordable childcare. Well, I'm delighted to say the NEC has recognised this and committed to giving the Women's Conference a formal policy-making role in the future. And following a consultation with our councillors, the NEC has also agreed a set of rule changes for local government. These will make our processes more transparent increased diversity and the number of women in senior positions. And we will provide better support for our amazing Labour councillors. We'll also be devolving significant new powers to the Labour parties of Scotland and Wales. It's great 
It's great to see Kezia here today. And Carwin, I can tell you how happy I am that Labour still has a First Minister in Wales. To those who worked to hard to make that happen, thank you. And I hope you will also support the changes the NEC recommend later on this week. Last year, Jeremy and I pledged to support candidates from low-income backgrounds, including those working in traditional jobs and trades, candidates like Chris Elmore, who recently joined us in Parliament and was on stage with Ogmore CLP barely half an hour ago. Be before being elected as the MP for Ogmore, Chris was a trainee butcher. He's the son of a roofer and a, ca a carer. And I've got to say, Chris, congratulations on your election. We're thrilled to have you. We need more Chrises in Parliament. We need more women. We need more ethnic minority candidates. A Parliament that represents the communities we seek to serve. And I'm delighted that this pledge is now about to become a reality with the new bursary scheme we're launching this week. I'd like to say a big thank you to Jenny Formby and Chulo for their help in driving this. The separate bursary scheme to support candidates with disabilities, championed by my colleague on the NEC, James Asser, is something that I know all of us here will also welcome. You'll be able to find out more about this on our website and over at the Labour Party stand. All of this is about giving greater support to our members, reconnecting with the hundreds of thousands of people who make the Labour Party what it is, and helping them reconnect with their wider communities too. When I stood to be your deputy leader, I promised a digital revolution in the party. I'm just going to give you a brief overview about what we've been up to since then, some of the things we've made and what we're going to be doing over the coming weeks and months. Our teams have been listening to members to find out their needs. The experts call it user experience. They've been building tools that empower members and connect them with their communities, from street to screen and back again. And our digital team started earlier this year. They didn't start with code. They started with simple questions. Why did you join Labour? What did you expect from us? What do you need from us? And you know, they found a lot that worked, but they also found a lot we could fix, especially for our new members. For them, the party sometimes seems really jumbled up. It sometimes seems really jumbled up for older members as well, by the way, but I'm not going there. It's not always clear how you get involved. So they've started building the foundations of a more joined up Labour Party. On their own, these changes might not seem a lot, but cumulatively, they're going to make a big change to the way we organise ourselves. My Labour is at the heart of that. It's a mobile-friendly platform designed to help every member of our party play a full and active role to make it easier for you to get involved. It has a digital membership card where you can see the details you gave us when you joined the party and then easily change them yourself. You can find the contact details of your local Labour Party and the officers, events for you to get involved in, and have a say in the development of Labour Party policy. You can find out more about My Labour and activate your account by visiting Stand 48 right outside. Once you've done that, you'll be able to contact directly from inside My Labour. Tell us what worked, tell us the ways you could see the things being used, and tell us how we can make it more useful. We've also built a canvassing app. A lot of you have been asking for this for a very long time, because after that grim, rainy day of canvassing, you've been coming home with soggy sheets of paper. I've heard people of drying them out on radiators before entering that data into Contact Creator. So the new Doorstep app will make life easier for thousands of campaigners up and down the country. It will upload to Contact Creator at the end of every canvas session, meaning our activists can spend more time talking to voters, less time entering data. I knew that would get a clap. <laughs> and if you want to test out this new app, pop over to the party stand and they'll get you set up. There are training sessions happening here at conference and we're rolling training out across the regions in the next few weeks. These new tools and services are just the start. 
We've done lots more work behind the scenes so we can build things more quickly and easily in the future. We've been built, they've been built in a way that is easy to build on. They're going to be improved and tweaked and fixed all the time and based on what members tell us they need. These are the tiny first steps of our digital revolution. It doesn't end here and new tools are only half of the story. More functionality will be added in the months ahead. I also said I'd prioritise community organising and give you the tools and training you need to start reconnecting with your local community. Lots of that great work is already happening. So I've been out talking to our members around the country to find out what we can learn and how we can share that best practice across the party. Earlier this month, I went to Withenshaw, where Mike Kane, an excellent MP, and our excellent Labour councillor, Sarah Judge, started a fantastic community organising project to help women in their area who were suffering from domestic abuse. When she started talking to women about this issue, Sarah found many women who felt failed by the system. She found women who were disengaged with the political process, women who said they'd never voted in their lives and thought politics was something people in posh houses in London did. Sarah started working with them, agitating them to take action, campaigning for real change to support victims of domestic abuse in Withenshaw. I was humbled to meet Lisa, who told me how she got involved in the project after coming out of an abusive relationship. Now, I want to take a minute now to share with you Lisa's story. I'm Lisa, I'm the coordinator of the Safe Spot Centre in Withenshaw. My first relationship, I was 17. Everything was really good at first, then a few months into the relationship, the crack started to appear. It was just name calling and things like that. Then that soon led to like physically abusing me. He broke my bones, he stabbed me. I was pregnant at the time. So, um, I pulled up the courage to call the police. And at that point he was with a gang. So they bullied me threatened me, there was threats to kill and things like that, so I dropped the charges against him, ended up back in the relationship. That carried on the same abuse, controlling me and everything for three years. So one day I plucked up the courage and I thought I couldn't say it no more, it was either I stayed and took the abuse or there was fear that I'd probably end up dead, so I left. It changed my life completely. I've got more confidence than what I had. I would never ever have thought that I would have spoke out. With that, I learned that my feelings did matter. Speaking out mattered as well. So I looked into it. I became a member and I've it ever since. The vision I have for my future is to all safe spots out into other areas and get the help and support that women need for domestic abuse. And maybe one day in the near future, I'd like to be a local councillor in my own area, supporting the local residents. Well, I, I want you to think about what Lisa just said. By getting involved in this community organising project, Lisa started seeing that politics is made of people and that by building relationships and banding together to campaign for change, you can improve the lives of the people around you. She joined the Labour Party. Over 360 women have already been to Safe Spot Centre for help and advice since they opened their doors earlier this year. And now Lisa wants to stand to be a Labour councillor. I can't tell you how proud I am of Lisa. She's brave and compassionate and decent. And I'm thrilled she's here with us today. Please welcome her, Lisa. Want to stand up? But I want you to do more than that. Because when I, put, when I met Lisa, she put me right on the spot. She used a community organising technique called a PIN, asking for a specific commitment from an individual who can help her cause. 
She told me that women who are in the same position as she was, women who were trying to escape an abusive relationship, trying to get help for themselves and their family from our courts, are being charged £75 for a letter from their GP to say they're a victim of domestic violence so that they can access legal aid. Sometimes even more. Lisa told me women are coming into the Safe Spot Centre asking for help because they're getting charged £125 for a letter. 125 quid for a piece of paper. A piece of paper that says, yes, this woman is suffering from domestic abuse. Yes, she needs help. Lisa pinned me to support her campaign. And I'm going to pin the Labour Party conference to support it too. So we've started a petition. And I want you to go online and sign it now. I don't need to pass this through the National Policy Forum to say that a future Labour government will scrap this hidden health fee. But this won't be the last you'll hear from me on this in opposition, because we're going to keep pushing with Lisa, and we're going to keep campaigning until we get this changed, until that fee is scrapped and women like Lisa have access to the justice they need, we're not going to stop. This type of campaigning is what we need to be doing all across the country. The campaign started in the community and now we're taking it online from street to screen and back again. And as Jeremy said yesterday, we have to rebuild from the grassroots up, engaging with our communities, with people like Lisa. And we need to help you do that by sharing this best practice and giving you the tools and training you need to do the job. Back in July, we brought together over 100 Labour Party activists from across the country to learn and share best practice at our first ever Young Activists Academy and Community Organising Summer School. It was brilliant to see these people so eager to learn, to take what they've learned from their training weekend back out into their communities. Now we're going to roll out that training for all our members. There are training sessions on digital campaigning and community organising happening here at the conference and online. You'll find lots more information on the party stand, including our new community organising guide. Let's be clear, this work matters. We're not making these changes because we want to be more modern or because we'd like to think we understand social media. We're making them because we need to win, and these changes will help us do that. The millions of people in our country who need a Labour government demand that we win. And this is how Labour has always won. Organising in our communities, building and mobilising our local government base, spreading our message beyond Parliament in order to win power in Parliament. This is a first step, but it's a vital first step. Thank you, Conference. Okay. Um. Thank you, Tom, for, for that uh, best practice, the innovation, creativity that's been shown. And also a special thanks to Lisa for the courage to be able to show yourself in the conference. <laughs> conference now stands adjourned until 2.15pm. Thank you and see you later on.